Good morning and welcome to Discover Life Seventh-day Adventist Church, where our mission is to know God, grow together, and do good. This week we continue to meet on the asphalt just next to the Melage Lawn. If you'd like to come out for a Sabbath school, head on over at 10 a.m. If you'd like to come for church, head on over at 11. Masks are required, we'll do a short screening, and you need to bring your own chair. All are welcome. If you can't make it out in person this week, or you just want to do your giving online, you can do so by going to discoverlifesonora.org. Click on the Give button, and this will redirect you to adventistgiving.org. There you can give your tithes, your offerings, or gifts to our Imagine campaign. Gentlemen, today I want to give you the friendly reminder that next weekend is Valentine's. Whether it's a mom, a sister, a spouse, or some other loved one, be sure to take care of those ladies in your life. And maybe as you're doing that, take a moment to think, what does my spending say that I love? Am I dedicating my time and resources to showing my family that I love them, to showing the world that I love them? Am I acting as though everything that I have belongs to the Lord, or does my spending say that I love myself? I am grateful today for the ultimate example of love. If we're to take a look at God's record books and see where he spends his money, we would see a clear pattern, a clear demonstration that he loves us and cares for us beyond what we could ever begin to comprehend. Praise the Lord that we serve a God like this. And that is everything I have for you this week. On behalf of Discover Life Sonora, our staff and media team, Allow me to wrap this up by saying we are grateful that each and every one of you have chosen to join us and hope that you're blessed by today's worship experience. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. We're separated. We're in different places. Maybe some of us are in our homes. Perhaps you're watching this in your car. You may be visiting a, a family member in Nebraska or who knows where. We're separated in many ways and yet we're together. We're together in our hopes and dreams and our longings for that better day when Jesus comes it makes everything right. It's been a tough time um, with uh, COVID, with uh, separation in, uh, at work, school, uh, people not able to be together. Um, my brother Dan and I are leading out music this morning and we can lean on each other and we can lean on the everlasting arms. And that's the hymn we wanna share, we wanna sing this morning. Leaning on the everlasting arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine. Leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a
secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning on the everlasting arms. And now, as we think about bringing our hopes and our fears and laying them before God, sing with me. I cast all my cares upon you. I lay all of my burdens down. Thank you so much for joining us on the Discover Life online worship experience. I'm so glad you're watching, and I'm really looking forward to what God has in store for us today. Uh, but before we dive into our text and our study time, I'd like for us to pray together. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day of life, and we thank you that you have given us the opportunity to learn and grow and to study your word. Father, today we ask that you would teach us, that we would learn of you and from you, that your spirit would be our guide. Father, we take all of our cares and we cast them on you. You promise that when we cast our cares upon you, you will sustain us. You promise that when we cast our cares upon you, it, you care for us. God, as we open your word now, teach us, instruct us, and... May this time we spend together be meaningful and enriching, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've been working our way through the book of 1 Timothy, and we are now in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and 1 Timothy chapter 2 has been gravely misunderstood, and it has been used in ways that are oppressive to women. So before we get into the nuts and bolts of what's actually going on in 1 Timothy chapter 2, we need to take a broader look at the biblical foundation for gender roles and the relationship between the sexes. Now, in order to do this, let me take you to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, and let's look at verses 26 to 28. 
The Bible it describes our creation, the creation of humanity, and the Bible says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Here in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26, 27, and 28, the Bible describes the creation of our first parents, Adam and Eve. And in the description of that, we see that Adam and Eve are created as full equals. I'm going to put it back up on the screen. It says, let us make mankind in our image. Adam and Eve, mankind, is are both made in the image of God. They both reflect God's likeness. They both rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and over all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. What I want you to see is, is that Adam and Eve in verse 26 here are given the identical uh, responsibility of bearing the image of God, that is to reflect out who God is. They are both given the responsibility to rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the livestock, over the wild animals. Then in the, the next verse, we see God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. They both equally share in the imago Dei, the image of God. And then in verse 28, he says, be fruitful and increase in number. They both share in the responsibility to, to procreate. Uh, they both have the responsibility to fill the earth and to subdue it, to rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and over every living creature that moves over the face of the ground. Now, what we need to see is, according to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26, 27, and 28, there is no such thing as women's work and men's work. Uh, Genesis 1, 26, 27, and 28, both men and women are co-regents. They're both co-rulers of the world. They're both given dominion over the animal kingdom. They are both ruling and reigning, bearing the image of God in full equality. Now, what's important to note is that the, the text specifically excludes male rulership over female, right? Like, like men are explicitly forbidden from ruling over women, and women are explicitly forbidden or excluded from the uh, rulership over men. I, I, again, let's go back and look at the text. Uh, the Bible says here in verse 26, God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish. Okay, so Adam and Eve, mankind, humankind, has the authority to rule over the fish, over the birds, over the livestock, over the living creatures um, that move along the ground. Uh, they have the right to rule over all these things, but they are not given the right to rule over one another. And so what we see in Genesis chapter 1 is that there is absolute, total, full equality of Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 1. Now, in spite of this dramatic picture of full equality, full egalitarian nature of their relationship in Genesis chapter 1, many people have looked to Genesis chapter 2, and they have seen in Genesis chapter 2 uh, this idea of a gender hierarchy, that there's sort of this man over woman, husband over wife, and um, what they, where they get that from Genesis chapter 2, and what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of those, those gender hierarchy arguments from Genesis chapter 2, and what we're going to find out is, is that on the surface, 
there, there, the, the argument may sound compelling, but upon more careful consideration, it becomes clear that these arguments in favor of a gender hierarchy are really based not on God's word, but on human prejudice. So, so the first argument from Genesis chapter 2 of a gender hierarchy is that man was created first and woman was created last. And, and the idea is, is that that means that he is superior or that he is the head and the leader. And therefore, she must be inferior and subordinate. Of course, we read in Genesis 2.22 that Eve, the woman, was made from the rib. Now, uh, you can see that here on the screen. Uh, unfortunately, or, or fortunately, I guess we should say, um, yes, it is true that Eve was made from Adam, but the idea that Eve being made from Adam, and that means Adam was created first, so the idea that Adam was created first and Eve was created second, the idea that that somehow implies that um, Eve is, is, is somehow inferior to Adam is is just really it holds no water first off because the animals were actually created before adam so if if timing of creation means that you have some priority because you were created first then then adam would be inferior to the animals since the animals were created prior to adam so so first off that's just uh, crazy. Second off, second off, the the story is what's called a ring construction, and this is a this is a Hebrew writing technique, and the story begins with Adam and it goes to Eve, and fascinatingly, the the story of Genesis two uses the identical number of Hebrew words to describe the creation of Eve as it does to describe the creation of Adam. And the idea is not the idea of, of, of um, a superior Adam moving to an inferior Eve. No, the idea is an idea of full equality. You move from Adam to Eve, and the story is, is actually a story of full equality. The idea that being created first means that you are the head or the superior, it's certainly not true. As I've already mentioned, the animals were created before Adam, and if it were true that being created first means priority and authority and superiority, then the animals would be superior. And we actually have examples in the ancient world. The Akkadian creation story has Eve being created first first, then Adam. But fascinatingly, the Akkadian culture is highly patriarchal. So what that means is, is the idea that being created first necessarily means that that, that person who is created first is superior is patently false, because we know from other ancient Near Eastern cultures that sometimes in their creation stories, the woman is created first and the man is still in a position of superiority. Amazingly, the story of Genesis chapter 2, the story of the creation from the true God, is a story of full equality. Man and woman, both equal rulers, both equal priority, both given the identical number of words to describe their creation. Now, the, the second argument that is sometimes made centers on um, God speaking to Adam, not Eve. And you can see that here in Genesis 2, verse 16 and 17. The Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So it is supposed, since God speaks to Adam and not to Eve, that there is uh, somehow priority given to the man. What, what people miss here is, is the narrative moves from incompleteness to completeness. 
That is, Adam is incomplete in, in, in himself, and he is not complete until there is a helpmeet for him. So the story moves from incompleteness to completeness. And since the story isn't over, that is, Eve hasn't come on the scene, and in this intervening time between the creation of Adam and the creation of Eve, Adam needs to feel the sense of incompleteness. Ah, but there is a danger. There is a danger that he might fall into sin, that he might fall into transgression if he is unaware of the rules of the game, that is, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So we should not see in this story um, God instructing Adam to avoid the tree of the knowledge of good and evil as a, as a somehow trying to say that men are superior to women because God talked to Adam but not Eve. What, what we should actually see is, is that God is preparing Adam, he is protecting Adam from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil while the story is yet incomplete. Now, the next sort of idea is found in verse 18, where the Bible says, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper comparable to him. Now, often we hear the word helper. In English, when we hear the word helper, we tend to think of a, a, an assistant. We tend to think of somebody who is um, lower in position or rank. Somebody, uh, I hate to use the word, but we tend to think of the word helper as somebody who is inferior, right? Um, in rank, not uh, in their person, but certainly inferior in rank. So, you know, you are, you are the, you know, the, say you're in the operating room, there's the surgeon and he is at the top of the heap and everybody else there is, is there to help the surgeon. So we tend to think of the word helper in this hierarchical kind of way in the English language. Fascinatingly enough, the word helper in Hebrew does not imply rank. It, it actually is a neutral word, but, and this is the fascinating part, most of the times the word help or helper is used, it is used of God as the helper of humanity. In other words, most of the time the word helper is used Rather than being a subordinate helper, it's actually a superordinate helper. That is, the person is, is, is actually in a stronger position. I'll, I'll put it up on the screen here um, as an example. Psalm 30, verse 10, Hear, Lord, and be merciful to me, Lord, be my help. In this text, the Lord is our help. He is our helper. And if you look up the word helper, all throughout the Old Testament, you'll see over and over and over again that God is the helper of his people, Israel. So when, when we read in uh, the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, that God says it's not good for man to be alone and that he will make him a helper, He's not saying that he's going to make some little assistant. He's not saying he's going to make somebody inferior. No, he's actually saying that uh, he's going to make a very strong, powerful person. That's what a helper is in the Old Testament. And then you can see here, if you're looking at the text, a helper comparable to him. The power of the woman was comparable to the power of the man. Rather than teaching some sort of inferiority, this text is actually teaching about the full equal power of the woman in the creation story. Now, sometimes people assume that because Eve was derived from the rib of Adam, that that somehow implies inferiority. And I'll, I'll put that text up here. So the Lord God calls, caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with 
flesh. Verse 22, then the Lord made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and brought her to the man. Now, the idea that since Eve was taken from the rib of Adam, that somehow that means that Eve is inferior to Adam is ludicrous, right? Like, like Adam was actually created from the dirt, okay? Does that mean that the dirt is superior to Adam? Of course not. The idea that Eve was not made from Adam, in other words, it wasn't like there was a woman inside of Adam and God popped a woman out of Adam. No, God took the raw material of Adam and built uh, the woman, Eve, out of that raw material. But Eve is no more inferior to Adam than Adam is inferior to the dirt since God made Adam out of the dirt. Now, when we look at the book of Genesis, um, we actually see here in um, verse 7, and I, I just quoted it, but you can see here it's in Genesis 2-7 that man was made out of the dirt. Now, Ellen White affirms this interpretation of the equality of Adam and Eve, and I'm just going to put her quote up on the screen. God himself gave Adam a companion. He provided a helpmeet for him a helper corresponding to him, one who was fitted to be his companion and who could be one with him in love and sympathy. Eve was created from a rib taken from the side of Adam, signifying that she was not to control him as the head, nor to be trampled under his feet as an inferior, but to stand by his side as an equal, to be loved and protected by him." Now, I want you to see in this quote, I mean, Ellen White's really clear, like the fact that, 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 that Eve was taken from the rib of Adam is designed to communicate equality and mutuality. She's not from the head as if she were going to be above Adam, and she's not from the feet as if she was going to be below Adam. No, Eve was taken from the side of Adam to communicate the equality and the mutuality of their relationship. She, she goes on here, uh, she continues on, as a part of man, bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, she was his second self, showing the close union and affectionate attachment that should exist in this relation. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall be one. The reality is that Genesis chapter 1 is very clear. Humanity, Adam and Eve, were both rulers. They were both image bearers. They were both procreators. Adam and Eve were given the identical work. The idea of man's work and women's work did not exist in the Garden of Eden. Both were, were gardeners, both were rulers, both were procreators. They, 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 there was no distinction between, the, the, between man's work and women's work. They both shared identical responsibilities. And any idea of hierarchy, men over women, in the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, is absolutely foreign to the text of Scripture. It's foreign to um, any careful reading of Genesis chapter 1 and 2. In fact, it really imports into Genesis 1 and 2 ideas that are not there. Now, after the fall, after Adam and Eve sin, I want you to read what Genesis 3 verse 16 says. Genesis 3 verse 16. After the fall, after sin, it says, to the woman, he said, this is God speaking, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Now, here in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, we see that after the fall, asymmetry is introduced into the marital relationship. 
That is, Adam and Eve, there was no reason for hierarchy. There was no need for submission. They got along perfectly. There was no strife. There, were, there was no discord. There was never an occasion sometimes where you're like, well, we've got decision A and decision B, and both decision A and decision B are equally moral, and we have to make a decision, two people making a decision about, about which direction we're going to go. There was never that situation in the Garden of Eden. Everything was perfect. There was no never this kind of division. But after the fall, hey, you know what? We've got two decisions. And, and so after the fall, the book of Genesis is very clear that, that the woman would have a desire for her husband, but that he would rule over her. Now, Ellen White actually comments on this, and I actually think that she does a very compelling job of capturing the biblical evidence. And here, here's the biblical, uh, her summary of the biblical evidence. Eve was told of the sorrow and pain that must henceforth be her portion. And the Lord said, Thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. In the creation, God had made her the equal of Adam. Okay, th that's exactly what we've been reading in the book of Genesis, and that's exactly what we've been seeing. In the creation, God had made her the equal of Adam. Had they remained obedient to God in harmony with his great law of love, they would have ever been in harmony with each other. I mean, this is exactly what I just said. Uh, uh, according to Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 1 and 2, Adam and Eve were full equals. They, uh, as, long as, they, as, they as long as they stayed uh, in a sin-free state, they would they would operate well as equals. Okay, now let's let's look at the next slide here. But sin brought discord, and now their union could be maintained and harmony preserved only by submission on the part of one or the other. Okay, so now sin is here, and there is going to be required some some submission in order to preserve this relationship. Eve had been the first in transgression, and she had fallen into temptation by separating from her companion, contrary to the divine direction. It was by her solicitude that Adam sinned, and she was now, and that's a key word, she was now placed in subjection to her husband. Now, I want you to notice something really important, and that is that, that all women are not subjected to all men. Big point. All women are not subjected to all men. Look, look what's going on here. Genesis 3, it is wives who are subject to their husbands. Your desire will be for your husband, says the Lord, and he will rule over you. Again, Ellen White says it um, uh, really clearly. Um, she was now placed in subjection to her husband. Had the principles enjoined in the law of God been cherished by the fallen race, this sentence, though growing out of the result of sin, would have proved a blessing to them. Now, I want you to notice what Ellen White says here. Uh, she says that, um, that the command for a husband to rule over his wife, that command grew out of the results of sin. And because of the division that sin brought, this rule would have proved a blessing. But notice what she goes on to say, but man's abuse of the supremacy thus given him has too often rendered the lot of woman very bitter and made her life a burden. Now, let's summarize the evidence that we've seen so far. In Genesis chapter 1, God gives Adam and Eve the same responsibilities, the same work, the same rights, the same privileges. They are full equals. We looked at five arguments for some sort of hierarchy in creation. And what we learned is, is that those arguments do not overcome what Genesis 1 says. In fact, those arguments are silly. It's absolutely silly to assume being created first means that you are in a position of authority over. That's silly. 
The, the, the animals were created before Adam. It's silly to think that because Eve was created from Adam that, that he's superior. E, Adam was created from the dirt. The dirt's not superior. We looked at the arguments that people make trying to introduce some hierarchy where no hierarchy exists, and their arguments don't hold water. And when you look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, it becomes abundantly clear that there was some hierarchy introduced not to all men and all women, but to husbands and wives as a result of the fall. Now, we're going to take a quick journey into the New Testament, and we're going to look at an important principle. Uh, and maybe before we read this, we need to talk about the Eden to Eden principle. Eden embodies perfection and beauty and the way the world was supposed to be. The way the world was supposed to be is husbands and wives were to get together in full equality and work together in full equality for the good of this world. That's the original plan in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. As a result of sin, there was discord and Submission became, therefore, necessary as a result of the discord that was introduced to the relationship. Now, there's a principle, a theological principle. Eden lost. That's in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. In Revelation, we have something even better than Eden. Eden restored in the heavenly city. Eden lost. Eden restored. That's what we see in Genesis that's what we see in Revelation. My friends, as Christians, we are going back to Eden when God restores all things. So, right now, I do my best. Right now, I do my best. Even though I don't live in Eden, I do my best to live like I'm in Eden. What do I mean by that? I mean that I, well, for example, as a Seventh-day Adventist, um, I, 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 I eat vegetarian. Okay. I, I mean, I may once a year have some fish, but, but essentially I'm a vegetarian. Okay. Now, the reason I'm a vegetarian is that in the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve, there was no death. There was no pain. Adam and Eve were given vegetarian food to eat. That's, that's what we read in Genesis chapter one. So part of the, the Eden loss to the Eden restored thing is I'm doing my best to live like Eden now. And so I choose to be vegetarian. One of the other ways that I, I try to live like Eden now is I try to have a Christian home without a lot of strife. I try to have a Christian home without a lot of division. I try to have a Christian home filled with equality and mutuality so that I don't have to say, I'm the husband, I'm the boss, because we are choosing to live like Eden. Now, if ever there were a disagreement, I'm sure that my wife would be happy to be submissive to me. But the truth of the matter is, is that we work together to pursue mutuality. And I want you to notice what Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 says. It says, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There is neither male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. We, as believers, are pressing back toward the, the Edenic ideal and the ideal that's coming again when the, there's a new heaven and a new earth, that, that ideal where, where there is full equality among men and women, Jews and Gentiles, slaves and free, we're pressing toward that ideal. And we see that in the book of Ephesians, the classic text on husband and wife relationships. In Ephesians, it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. There is mutual submission in the marital relationship. He goes on to say, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as, to, as you do to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, which, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. The basic idea here is, 
is that, yes, the Bible says that wives are to submit to their husbands. Yes, the Bible says husbands are to love their wives. But before the Bible says any of that, the Bible says that we are to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, and we are to remember that there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This is the Edenic ideal. This is the direction the church is called to move. The church is called to embrace the Edenic ideal that there is not this hierarchy between slaves and their owners, and their masters. There's not a hierarchy between Jews and Gentiles. There's not a hierarchy between men and women. We're called to embrace this idea of mutual submission. And, and in our family relationships, we are to, to embrace this mutuality. And, and yes, there may be times where, where the situation demands a person make a decision. And, and in that case, uh, in the marital relationship, the husband has that right in a Christian home. But in my home, in my home, I don't let our home get to the place where I have to be the decider. I lead and my wife participates in, in our family life. She leads in our family life in a way that we work together mutually for the benefit of our family and the benefit of our children. Now, that all, all that background, all of that background in, in biblical theology is so that when we get to our text in Timothy, that we can make some sense out of it. So we're going to, we ended last week's message on 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, and we're going to start in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. And we're going to, we're not going to be on, well, it's, it's about men and women and different roles and responsibilities. Uh, therefore, I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. So here the Apostle Paul reminds men, I don't want you to lift your hands up, put up your dukes, kind of. I want you to lift your hands up in prayer, okay? Now, he goes on, I also want women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. Now, I want you to see those three words. You can see them there up on the screen. Modesty, decency, propriety. Modesty, decency, propriety. The word modesty in the original is to be in accord with the accepted standards of propriety. All right. When we think of modesty, we think in terms of not too revealing. And certainly Christians should be appropriate in their dress in that way. But the idea of modesty is, is actually uh, in accord with accepted standards of propriety, okay? So it's, it's not like there is a universal, never-ending definition of what is, is modest. Um, what is modest is that which is accepted, uh, that which is in accordance with accepted standards of propriety. Two, decency. Decency, the word translated decency means respect for convention. And propriety means good judgment, moderation, or self-control. Now, what Paul is urging the church, what Paul is urging the church to do is to dress in a way that is consistent with the society's norms. In other words, you need to be careful in the city of Ephesus that you are not dressing in a way that puts you out of step with the people of Ephesus. Now, in order to kind of understand this, we need to understand a little bit about the way the Roman world worked. Being appropriate, being modest, not wearing too much jewelry were all really, really important in Roman culture. In fact, I'm going to read you a quote right now. I'm not going to put it up on the screen. Rome's governing elite produced laws designed to limit public displays of personal wealth and luxury. Now, I want you to follow this. The Roman elite, the Roman elite said, look, we are going to make laws and we do not want you 
displaying your wealth in these very public ways. Um, in other words, Rome produced laws that said, don't wear a bunch of jewelry, don't wear fancy haircuts, don't wear expensive clothes. Essentially what Rome realized is, is that, that, that when people, people looked up and they saw the, 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 the ruling class in all of their wealth, and then people wanted to dress like them and act like them, and so Rome, basically said, um, you can't do this. Now, fascinatingly enough, none were particularly successful, as the same wealthy elite had an appetite for luxurious and fashionable clothing. Exotic fabrics were available at a price. Silk, translucent gauzes, cloth of gold, intricate embroideries, and vivid expensive dyes, such as saffron yellow or chiron purple. Not all dyes were costly, however, and most Romans wore colorful clothing. Clean, bright clothing was a mark of respectability and status among all social classes. So, so, so Paul, when he tells the church to, to, to wear clothing that is modest, that is in accord with the accepted standards of propriety, uh, when he tells them to dress decently, that is, that respects the convention, when he tells them to wear clothes that are uh, that have propriety, he's telling them to use good judgment, moderation, and self-control. What he's telling them is that, that they should do what Rome is asking them to do, which is wearing clean, well-cared-for clothing. And, then, and he's also telling them to do what Rome wants them to do, i.e., don't display your wealth with expensive jewelry. Just don't do it. And uh, interestingly enough, most of the Roman jewelry came in the form of brooches. If you've seen the Roman togas, right? Like a Roman toga is just this flowing garment that you kind of just wrap around you and, and you pin it together with brooches. And these brooches were a, a way to, to display their wealth. And, and, and so... What Paul is saying, wildly, right? This is crazy. Paul is telling the people in Ephesus, live like the, the people of Ephesus want you to live, right? Don't wear expensive clothes, okay? That's what the aristocracy does, and, and you're not supposed to do that. Don't wear all this gold and jewelry and elaborate hairstyles, right? That's what the aristocracy does, that's, but you are not supposed to do that. So we need you to live within the boundaries. And there's always this temptation, right? Like, 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 like you're making a little bit more money, you're doing a little better, and you, you, wanna, you wanna keep up with the Joneses. And, and in the Roman society, the way to keep up with the Joneses was buying more and more expensive jewelry and putting your wealth on display. Interesting little side note, just a little side note. 2018, that's the statistic I found. The average American spent $90 on jewelry, $90, okay, a year, okay? $90 a year on jewelry. So I would say the average American is not displaying their wealth by wearing jewelry, right? Like, like, like 90 bucks a year, that's like, that's less than $9 a month that they have spent on jewelry. That's the average American. So the average American is not displaying their wealth with jewelry. Second, the average American spends about $200 a month on drinks, right? So that's like, I'm hitting the Starbucks and getting a coffee, I'm, I'm uh, going to Safeway, I'm getting a kombucha, I'm drinking Cokes. And, and so fascinating to me that, that the average American spends $200 a month on drinks and $90 a year on jewelry. So uh, I would just say that, that we need to be careful in how exactly we apply this text today. Uh, maybe we could say, as a bottom line, dress in ways that do not break your society's conventions about modesty, decency, and propriety. Dress in ways that do not conspicuously display your wealth. And there is always a temptation there is always a temptation to, to display rather 
then the true beauty, which is good works, that's what Paul says here in verse 10, we should dress with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. All right, now, now we're into really verse 11, and this is the, this is the, the heart of the matter. Look, look what the Apostle Paul says. Paul says, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. Verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. Now, I want you to notice something really significant here. Verse, verse 10, um, I want you to notice that, that a woman is to be dressed with good deeds appropriate for, and I want you to notice that, for women. That's an E-N. Now, in verse 11, in verse 11, check out verse 11, there is a change. A woman. Now, women is plural there in verse 10, and verse 11, women is singular. Now, why the switch from plural in the preceding verses, women, to singular, women? Like, why, why this switch? The answer is actually very, very significant. When the Greek word for woman, singular, and man, and those are anar and gune, okay? So when the, he, the Greek word anar and gune, anar is man and gune is woman, when the words anar and gune are used in close proximity, they always refer to husbands and wives, all right? So when Paul says, uh, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. It is a better translation to say, verse 11, a wife should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a wife to teach or assume authority over her husband. She must be quiet. So, there's no question, absolutely no question in my mind that verse 12, 11 and 12, are not talking about women in general. They are talking about a specific type of women, and that is women who are married, okay? So Paul's counsel here that appears to some to be about women in general is actually specifically about married women. All right, and it's it's really fascinating what the apostle Paul says. Now I want you to notice the very first thing he says: a wife should learn. We're just going to stop right there. A wife should learn. Now in many Roman societies, women did not really enjoy the privileges of spiritual education as much as men did. And so to me, this simple statement, a woman should learn, is actually a very, a wife should learn, is a very powerful statement. It goes on to say that she should learn in quietness. Now, fascinatingly enough, the word quietness here is used in many other writings outside of the Bible to describe how all people are to learn. Now, Jewish synagogues had a very dynamic um, method of teaching, because of a, a conversational style of teaching, a discussion style of teaching. Um, Roman citizens had a more didactic, you know, I'm the teacher, you're the learner. And so in the Roman culture, when you were a learner, you were to learn quietly, okay? Now, a wife, Paul says, should learn in quietness and full submission. Now, what's fascinating about that word submission is that it, 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 it ties into a husband and wife's relationship. I do not permit a wife to teach or assume authority, not over all men, but over, notice that next word, her husband. She must be quiet. This text is not teaching that women cannot speak in church. This text is not teaching that women cannot have 
positions of spiritual authority in the church. That is not what this text is teaching. This text is teaching that women are not permitted to exercise spiritual authority in a way that undermines their relationship with their husband. Now, let me say that again. A woman is not permitted to exercise her authority in the church. She's not allowed to have roles or responsibilities in the church that undermine her relationship with her husband. Now, probably some of you are like, whoa, 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 like, help me understand this. Well, first off, if Paul was saying that women cannot talk in church, okay, then Paul is totally self-contradictory because there are many examples of women having very significant leadership roles in the church in the writings of the Apostle Paul and other New Testament writers. And I think it's very unlikely that Paul is willing to contradict himself and willing to contradict many other writers. So let me just give you a few examples here in the New Testament. Look at, at in Acts chapter 21, verse 9. There's a man named Philip who's an evangelist, and he had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. So Philip has four daughters who prophesy, and if you read 1 Corinthians 11, 12, 13, and 14, you'll see that the church was a place where prophets regularly spoke, okay? So, so point number one, there were female prophets, and female prophets definitely prophesied at church. Now, number two, put our next slide up on the screen. I commend to you, I'm in Romans 16, verse 1, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Shintria. Now, I want you to notice, Phoebe is a deacon. Now, there was no word deaconess in the New Testament time. The word deaconess didn't come into existence until several hundred years later. Deacons, uh, there was one category of servant, the word deacon means servant, and that, that one word, deacon, applied equally to men and women. There were deacons in the church, male deacons and female deacons. Phoebe was a deacon of the church in Centria. Now, if you look further down, Romans 1, chapter 16, verse 7, Greek Andronicus and Junia, Junia is a female name, Andronicus is a male name in the Greek, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me, they are outstanding among the apostles. Junia and Andronicus are outstanding apostles, right? Like, like you got the 12 and then you got whatever other apostles there were, but, but Andronicus and Junia are like considered outstanding apostles. Now, I just want you to understand, there were female apostles and they could be considered outstanding in their ministry. So, um, by the way, there's been all kinds of ways to try to get around the fact that there was a female apostle, and those ways, have, like first they said Junia was a male name. There's no evidence, none whatsoever. Um, in spite of lots of people writing articles and books about it, there is literally zero evidence that Junia is a, a, a male name. In fact, how much do you have to hate women in order to invent the idea that a female name is actually a male name so you can get around the idea that there were female apostles? It's ridiculous, the, 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 the misogyny, the, the, the actual hatred of women in the Christian church. That's, that's all it can be. That's all it can be. Junia was an outstanding apostle. That's just what the text says. And, and the idea that somebody comes along and they're like, no, there can't be female apostles. That's, that's, there just can't be. So let me write and invent this idea that this female name is actually a male name. It's just, it's just, it's just terrible. It's cruel. Now, um, another example of females leading in the church, Philippians 4, verses 2 and 3. I plead with Eudia, and I plead with Cynthia to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, I ask you, my true companions, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel 
along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Notice these women are called co-workers who contend at Paul's side in the cause of the gospel. Now, Colossians chapter 4, verse 15, give greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. Um, here in Acts chapter 18, there's a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria. He came uh, to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of Scripture, right? Okay, so you got this Jew. He's a learned man. He knows the Bible, and he's in Ephesus, and he's instructed. Uh, he had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. Now, notice what happens next. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more equally. Priscilla and Aquila are a husband and wife team, and together they are instructing this man in the way of God more fully, more adequately. A woman in a teaching role over a man. So, when we look at the Apostle Paul's words here in 1 Timothy, and if we read them as a woman should never teach or never open her mouth or never have anything to do with the church, we are absolutely missing the point. Now, there are some churches, there's Presbyterian churches, there's a lot of churches where, where women literally have no voice in the church. There are no women on their boards. There are no women worship leaders. Uh, sometimes maybe you'll have a woman singer. There are no women pastors. There are no women deacons. There are no women out. These people, these people completely and totally forbid women. There are no women Sunday school teachers in these churches. There are churches that understand Paul when he says that women should not... Uh, um, when, when, when Paul says that, that a wife should not have authority, um, they understand this to mean that women are not permitted in any way, shape, or form in any part of the public life of the church. This is a total misunderstanding. Paul says a wife should learn in submission, in, uh, in quietness and full submission. Paul says, I do not permit a wife to teach or assume authority over her husband. She must be quiet. In other words, my friends, if you are a woman and you are married and you have some role in the church, you should never engage in that role in the church in a way that undermines your first responsibility as a wife to your husband. That's all that Paul is saying. Now, let's continue on. I'll put another screen. Paul says, um, I'll read it to you again. Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority. I do not permit a wife to teach or assume authority over her husband. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Now, now, when people think that this is forbidding all women to serve in any way in the church because, because Paul gives some reason, that is, Adam was formed first, then Eve, and th they imagine that that means that, that, that Adam was in charge from the very beginning, and that's why women can't be in charge today, okay? Wives can't... Okay, now, that's a total misunderstanding. You've got to understand what was ha happening in Ephesus. I know I've been preaching a long time, but you've got to get this. Ephesus was the center of the worship of Artemis, okay? And Artemis, Artemis was, in that religion, they believed that Eve was created first, and because Eve was created first, she had authority over the man. I don't know if you caught that. In Ephesus, there was a religious cult there called the cult of Diana. Artemis is another name for her, okay? And in that religious cult, they believed that Eve was created first, and because Eve was created first, she had authority over Adam. So what we see here in 1 Timothy is not some universal law that, that women should never say anything in church. Give me a break. That's not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, hey, look, guys. I know in Ephesus, there's this thing where you think that 
Eve was created first. And because Eve was created first, the women are in domination over the men. Okay, I know that's what you think. But it's not okay for wives to dominate over their husbands. It's just, that's not okay. Right? Like, if you're, you shouldn't do that. It's not true that Eve was created first. No, Adam was created first. And Paul goes on. Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. Again, they, in Ephesus, they had reversed the whole story. The point in 1 Timothy, the bottom line in 1 Timothy, is that wives should not um, undermine their important relationship with their husband. No matter what they're doing, whatever they're called to do, if a woman is, is called to teach, she should never do that ministry in a way that undermines her relationship with her husband. If she's called to serve in the church, she should never engage in that ministry in a way that undermines her relationship with her husband. Um, because the family relationship is first and foremost. And that family relationship was designed in the beginning to be fully egalitarian, but there was hierarchy introduced at the fall. And, and, and in the husband and wife relationship, as, as, as much as we strive for mutuality, as much as we strive for full equal understanding of one another and full submission to one another, as Paul says, there may come times, there may come times when the wife must submit. And, and, and Paul is saying, look, ladies, no, Eve was not made first. No, you're not the boss. No, in your life in the church, you have to be submissive to your husband. We're going to end here in verse 15. And I'm really excited to put this on the screen because this verse has been confusing to many for many years, and it's got such a simple answer. But women, now he switches back to plural, but women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. What does Paul mean when he says women will be saved through childbearing? Okay, Paul is not saying that childbearing saves women. When we think of the word saved, we think it's like saved from sin, saved from eternity. No, the word saved can mean that, but the word saved also can mean protected from harm. Now, in Ephesus, Artemis was a deity who was linked to fertility, and listen, this deity was positioned, was petitioned to assist women with childbirth, all right? So you find yourself pregnant. Being pregnant's a big deal. Women still die in the process of giving birth. Being pregnant, it's dangerous business to be a childbearing woman, right? And in, in Ephesus, the women were used to praying and making gifts to Artemis to, to help them with childbirth. And if their babies died in childbirth, or if they miscarried, they would imagine that they had somehow offended Artemis. And so, and so what Paul is doing here when he says they'll be saved through childbearing, he's not saying that women somehow get eternal life as a result of childbearing. He's saying, no, if you are a woman of faith, if you're a woman of love, if you're a woman of holiness and propriety, then you will make it through childbearing. Not because Artemis comes to save you, but because you are safe and secure with Jesus. All right, bottom line, bottom line. Men and women are and always have been full equals in society. That's God's original plan, and that's what should always have been. Men and women have always been full equals in society according to God. Number two, since the fall, wives are called to be submissive to their husbands. Number three, because of the gospel, we are always called to go toward Eden. 
we should strive for God's Edenic ideal. Number uh, four, if you are a wife and serving in the church, make sure that you take into account your relationship with your husband in all that you do for the church. And lastly, as Christians, you don't have to look to other gods for help. You are safe and secure as long as you continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love. And Lord, we pray that you would knit our hearts together in Christian love and equality. In Jesus' name, amen.